We've already done part of Luke chapter 7. We will look at the last part of Luke chapter 7 today. The first part of Luke chapter 7, Jesus healed the centurion's servant from a distance. Didn't have to be there. He could be distant and just say, this person gets better. Jesus raised the widow's son from the dead during a funeral procession. Uh, Power over death is the main thing, but also many witnesses to the miracles. They weren't done out in the middle of nowhere. Lots of people were following Jesus as he walked to Nain, and lots of people were coming the other direction in the funeral procession. So we don't know how many, but there were many witnesses. Uh, The numbers given, though, are in other miracles like feeding of the 5,000 or feeding of the 4,000. And in those days, without television and cameras, that's about as many people as could see something. So he had as many witnesses as there could be and uh, stops in the middle of a funeral procession. Finally, we looked at John the Baptist last week, and John the Baptist had doubts, and he went to Jesus with his doubts, which is the right direction to go, and Jesus helped him with his doubts, and then went on to explain that uh, no one so far born was greater than John the Baptist, so great credibility, great approval, On the other hand, uh, those in the kingdom of heaven, the least will be greater than he, which means all of us actually have greater promises of our future than John the Baptist. And actually all of us know more truth than John the Baptist did. The Old Testament people wanted to know more, but it hadn't been revealed yet. And say John the Baptist didn't have the life of Christ in the Gospels. So John the Baptist didn't have John chapter 7. Uh, This brings us to John chapter 7. We will begin at verse 36. And uh, it uh, fits forgiveness, which has been uh, a lot of our music and a lot of our scripture reading. John chapter 7, verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table, and at the tables in italics. They often, they often lay down on um, little rugs, and they would have little trays in front of them. But the Last Supper, they didn't sit at a table. That's Italian from the 1500s. They laid down on the floor. Verse 37, while they were laying down on the floor, and there was a woman in the city who was a sinner, And she learned that he was reclining in the Pharisee's house, getting ready to eat. She brought an alabaster vial of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and she kept wiping them with the hair of her head, and kissing his feet, and anointing them with the perfume." Not going to give all the sermon to this topic, but... In the Bible, especially Luke's writings, there's lots of stories about ladies. We probably will get to chapter 8, verse 3, where Luke names some of the ladies who were disciples and names some of the donors who enabled Christ and the apostles to quit their work and travel around and do a missionary journey. The New Testament itself gives far more attention to ladies than the typical Gentile world of its time or the typical Jewish world of its time. Uh, This week, and I try not to watch liberal channels unless there's an advertisement, then I go over to them and they were... They they were saying being pro-life is an attack on women. And they were showing videos of men who didn't agree with the pro-life. And that is to show you that Christians are anti-women. Just a pack of liars. Anyway, lots of references to women in the Bible. And uh, uh, Jesus did both. You know, the man goes look for the missing sheep, but the woman cleans the house looking for the missing coin. And Jesus did one way, then he did the other way. And there are lots of stories about ladies 
especially in Luke's writings. And uh, we just did one last week, the widow and uh, funeral procession for her son. That was, that was a lady story. Uh, here is another lady story. And uh, it's probably evidence that Dr. Luke is the author, as the early church said, because there's lots of references to Gentiles, like healing the centurion, the Roman officer servant. Lots of references to ladies. Uh, lots of stories. So, and Jesus did the same thing. His second coming, uh, the bridesmaid had to get ready for the wedding. Tells that story. That's to get the lady's attention. Uh, Luke will write book of Acts, and he will talk about Dorcas and Tabitha, raised from the dead. He will talk about Lydia, the business lady. Uh, don't want to make a whole sermon on that, but it's kind of obvious that Dr. Luke, Luke put a lot of ladies in the Bible stories, and here's one right here. Now we continue. Um, they're eating. She is uh, pouring perfume on Jesus' feet. Verse 36. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what sort of person this is, this woman who is touching him. But she is a sinner. Verse 40. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, Say it, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii. Those are silver Greek coins. The other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Like more appreciation. Simon answered, I suppose, the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. There are going to be several topics that fit here. I mean, forgiveness is the main one. Sin and forgiveness. But I'd also like to talk a little bit about conscience. A person knowing right from wrong. She obviously had a guilty conscience. Uh, it's a bad time for liberals to say there is no right and wrong. They do say that. There's no such thing as a right and wrong. It's all cultural. It's all social. There are no moral absolutes. There's no right and wrong. Was it wrong to kill the school kids? They're not going to say that because that's really too ridiculous. So actually, even liberals say there is a right and wrong because they know wrong when they see it. They also know wrong when it's done to them. So we'll talk more about conscience, uh, but Romans 2, 14, 15 says that those who do not have the law know the work of the law in their hearts. And they do. They know right and wrong, either when they see it, they especially know it when it's done to them. They know. I'm pretty sure C.S. Lewis gave this illustration, so it's somewhat British, but uh, there is this uh, gentleman's club, and they're in there talking. There is no right and wrong. It's all made up. So uh, the waiter takes a teapot full of hot water and starts to, what? It wouldn't be wrong, he says. You just said it. There'd be no wrong if I'd scald your head. So the people who say there's no right from wrong, they know right from wrong when it happens to them. And in other times, it's so wrong, they know there's right from wrong. They have it in a conscience, even if they don't have a Bible. So uh, she had a guilty conscience. Um... Guilt is bad, but it's kind of a good thing to start because guilt uh, tells a person this needs to be fixed. It kind of be like not having any feeling and uh, not going to the doctor with a cut because you don't have any feeling. Well, guilt is a feeling that actually can produce a good thing if a person says, I want to get this guilt resolved. The guilt is in even people who don't have a Bible. They do know right from wrong. And guilt can be a good thing because in their conscience, they want to get it fixed. 
Now, the Bible does talk about a burned conscience. This is 1 Timothy, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, I think. But there's a burned conscience. Uh, we might say a callous conscience where a person doesn't do anything about their sin, doesn't do anything about their sin, doesn't do anything about their sin, gets support from other people, gets support. So after a while, the feeling declines. That's not the story here. She had a guilty conscience, and the guilty conscience was good because she's going to get it fixed. And it was a good thing that she had a guilty conscience. But uh, some would say it's seared with a hot iron, like 1 Timothy Chapter 2, uh, um, the feeling is gone. We'd say that the burn can't feel anything anymore in that spot. Or calloused can't feel anything more in that spot. And it can go down. Uh, not the story here, but it is the story in other times. And it is the story in our world. Way back in the school days, we had a textbook from Carl Menninger, which sounds German, but he was from Kansas, so lots of Germans in Kansas, and he wrote a book called Whatever Became of Sin. And the point of that book was, uh, don't talk about it anymore. Uh, I have uh, two friends that are Christian counselors, and they say it has long been declining and long getting to be a problem where in the old days uh, you're at the drug intake at the hospital you can talk about this is right this is wrong don't make these bad choices it hurts you and both of my friends that are counselors say we can't say that anymore we can't tell them this is right this is wrong and don't make that bad choice I, I have a friend who can't wait to retire now, they do say, if the person brings it up, we can respond. We can respond if they bring it up. This was a bad choice. Yes, they can respond. And, but if they don't bring it up. The other thing that's somewhat related, but only distantly related, is they can't tell them to turn their cell phones off. So they're counseling them, and they're all sitting there doing this. Okay. Okay. Not listen, not pay attention, can't bring up. This is wrong. Don't do it again. Can't you tell this is harmful? Can't bring it up unless they bring it up first. Wow. Well, this lady had guilt. The guilt will be good. There is false guilt. False guilt is when we didn't really do anything wrong, uh, like accident. If a person is in a car accident and harms another person, they didn't do it intentionally, there's such a thing as false guilt. But true guilt is a good thing because true guilt is a way of knowing this needs to be solved, this needs to be fixed. And she definitely had a conscience. And it wasn't as 1 Timothy 4, it wasn't seared or burned, it wasn't calloused. Let's read on with the story because uh, conscience has a part, but of course, forgiveness and sin are the greater parts. Uh, let's go on reading. Verse 44. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to, say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Well, they went to the Pharisee's house and got invited. And this Pharisee's name is Simon, which of course is not Simon Peter. And he's talking to Simon. He's probably talking loud enough that other people can listen. Uh, they had uh, dusty roads and uh, typical from other stories. They'd uh, definitely clean hands and clean feet before they eat. And Simon, didn't, uh, Simon wouldn't do that. 
Pharisees are not priests. Pharisees were a middle to upper class business people, and he wasn't going to do that. That was a servant's job, and so uh, that's why Jesus at the Last Supper did the servant's job. But here, Simon isn't going to do the servant's job. That's beneath him. He's way above. Uh, No kiss. Mm, Thought I'd look up the Greek word on that again. Phileo. We get tender love from it. But it's according to or down. They They added the preposition to it. So it's kind of like, Loving, uh, according to love, we kiss, or actually we kiss down sometimes. So uh, that's what that word means. It's related to the, kiss is related to the word tender love. That's why we often say phileo, like Philadelphia, means tender love. Agape means committed love. Don't even have to have feelings. You do what is right, whether it feels good or not. Kind of like taking care of babies. Might not feel good. Got a commitment. Agape. Phileo, more emotional, more tender, related to the word for kiss. But Simon, no washing water, no kiss, uh, no perfume. And uh, he gives the lesson, uh, she will be glad and is glad she's forgiven much. Then... uh, He says it. We can read one more verse, verse 48. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. We mentioned the book, Whatever Became of Sin. Well, it's still in the Bible. 580 references to sin in the Old Testament, 240 in the New Testament. That's 820 to sin. However, not all of the verses have the word sin. We have transgression, trespass, iniquity, wicked, lawlessness, unrighteousness, bad, and evil. Add them all together, maybe 2,000 references to some form of sin. So whatever became of sin in culture is one question. Whatever became of sin, well, it's in the Bible about 2,000 times The definition of sin is very often missing the mark. That fits. That fits. Judges 20 verse 6 talks about left-handed slingers who could hit the target and not sin. Which means they would not miss. They would not miss the mark. Judges 20 verse 6. Proverbs 19.2 speaks of a person who sins with his feet. And that's not really a theological or ethical verse. It's like going off the path, uh, going off in a different direction. And very often in Greek writings, the word for sin means to miss the mark. But that also helps to add transgression and trespass. Because sins can be mistakes or deliberate. The category of missing the mark can mean you tried to shoot the arrow and, oh well, made a mistake. Sin will allow either one, deliberate or making a mistake. But transgression is, we know the stop sign. We know the boundary, and we cross it anyway. So sin means missing the mark. Transgression means crossing the boundary. It's best to have a little bit of both. Book of Romans says that the law turns sin into transgression. We knew what was right and wrong, and we did it anyway. The main teaching is forgiveness. And I'll do it again when we do communion. I often talk about forgiveness. And often I make this uh, parallel. There's God as judge and God as father. It really matters because in a lot of uh, theological systems, they just merge them together And you have saved people who are now unforgiven. Did they lose their salvation? There's God as judge. And when we trust in Jesus as Savior, we're forgiven everything. Past, present, future, everything. The judge says, no condemnation. Pardon. God is judge. Then God is Father. 
And we can be forgiven before God is judge, but now God is Father. And we need fatherly forgiveness. That's more in the matter of fellowship. It's not a matter of eternal condemnation, but it's a matter of being right with the Father, and that's by confessing sin. And uh, we are all believer priests, so if we go to God directly, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, there's another verse like that in the uh, verses that we often read before we do communion, and I'll try to remember to point that out in a minute. So, uh, sin, missing the mark, transgression, there's the boundary, I'm going past it anyway. Forgiveness means picking up the heavy load and taking it away. It also means canceling a debt. So, the original words, both Hebrew and Greek, they actually have both of them. Picking up the heavy load and taking it off us. That's what forgiveness is. Or canceling a debt. And we see that second one right here in verse 42. The definition in the story of forgiveness was forgiving a debt. Well, so it is theologically. God forgives the debts of sin, and uh, God takes the heavy load away from us. Oh, we'll read the clothes. They were mad. Those are reclining at the table, actually laying down to eat. With him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So we can forgive another person a sin that they do directly against us. We cannot forgive all sins. And they're correctly, logically reasoning that someone who says, I can forgive all sins, that's a claim to be God. Yeah. That's what it was, a claim to be God. So, main lesson today is forgiveness, and forgiveness is carrying the heavy load away, and forgiveness is canceling the debt. Thank you. When the musicians come.